I'm Jeffrey Clark, and this is 90s Youth Life. In almost three years of me doing this podcast, I have never done anything on this large scale. I've had guests before, uh, but I've never had anybody on this large of a scale before. Uh, Joining me on the phone is a very special guest. He was happy to call me on my birthday, which is the day we're recording this. It's on Friday. Joining me on the phone right now is the host of the 90s game show, Where in the World is Carmen Sandiego, Acme Senior Agent in Charge of Training New Recruits, Greg Lee. Greg, thank you so much for joining me. Hey, pleasure, man. Thanks a lot. Yeah, I'm so gl- Yeah, thank you very much. I'm so glad you were able to do this. I know I keep saying that, but I really am glad that you're doing this. Uh, before we get started uh, talking about this wonderful 90s kids game show classic, which was on PBS from 91 to 95, let me just share a couple of personal memories I have of you from when I was watching. And keep in mind, I was like two to six years old when the show was on the air. <laughs> Okay, so one thing is, I had this VHS tape that I watched over and over again. The first half was a Sesame Street episode from uh, that time. It's your standard hour-long format. Well, I guess it's going back to a half hour now. And uh, the other half was two episodes from the first season of Carmen. And well, I would, what I would do very often was, as I was watching those episodes, I would get out my Carmen San Diego boards game. I'd lamp the crooks like they would be in the chief's office, the game pieces. And what I would do is I would uh, I'd wear this trench coat that I had, kind of like what, how you wore your jacket. Right. right, And then the other thing is, when I was three, four years old, uh, my parents got me my first atlas, and on the inside front cover, they had all this information for you to fill out, you know, your name, your address, your phone number, all that good stuff, and uh, the last line on there was travel agent, and, you know, since I couldn't write very well at that age, my dad filled out for me, and under, under travel agent, he wrote down Greg Lee. <laughs> Oh, man, you're cracking me. I love it. I love that, man. Oh, I'd love to see some of those pictures. I bet you're pretty cute in all of your stuff. That's pretty funny. That's pretty cool. Yeah, um, I will uh, send you a picture uh, once I find it. It's, it, it's somewhere in my photo albums. Uh, oh, that's pretty cool. It's almost here. It's so it's nice even after all these years here from, uh, you know, people that used to watch it and like it. It means a lot to me. The things that you called and wanted to do this and... Yeah, those kind of stories always mean a lot to me. It's pretty cool, man. I appreciate it. Yeah, so, so uh, let's start there. Um, you know, when I was reaching out to you about this, you mentioned how you always love to hear from former gumshoes who watch the program. So uh, how often do you hear from fans of the show, maybe former contestants of the show who grew up watching it? And, well, yeah, I've heard how it makes you feel, but uh, how do you feel about people reaching out to you? Well, you know, I, it's always flattering, and I, I hear a lot from people, actually. I hear, you know, more now probably than ever before, and I guess part of that's the technology and everything. It always is surprising to me, not that people enjoyed it, and they like to talk about it, but like they, they still want to say something about it, and they're still kind to say something to me about it. So um, it was such a great experience for me, and there's a great bunch of people, and it was, uh, you know, I like to, because it wasn't just a game show for me to host. I, I've never been interested in, like, hosting that kind of stuff. So uh, let's go back to the beginning for you, mm-hmm. not the very beginning of your life, but um, how did you first break into show business? What interested you in and how did you get your start? That's a great question. I, I have to say, it was never a uh, lifelong ambition of mine. I come from a long line of preachers and farmers. That was kind of more where I was kind of hanging from my life. And I think in my mid-20s, I guess, I left the... Uh, I was in Kansas City at the time. I'm from Nebraska and Oklahoma, but I was living in Kansas City. And I had a couple of buddies out in New 
York. So I just decided to go out there for a while. I kind of tired of doing whatever jobs I was doing at the time. I just thought I'd go out there and see my buddies and hang out and do some stuff. So I got some security job work and waiter work. Bicycle messenger without the bike work. And uh, I eventually kind of fell into what they used to call, I guess they still do call audience warm-up. I had a friend who was doing some shows over at CBS. It's a kid's show called Dr. Fad. And he said, I think you could probably do some audience warm-up for us with sort of, you know, kind of entertaining the audiences and horsing around with people, you know, in between shots. And um, so I kind of fell into that. And I kind of did that for a bunch of shows and did it for a bunch of Nickelodeon shows. And the first show that I actually was on camera for was one called Total Panic for Nickelodeon, which was like a three-hour live show that I was doing audience warm-up for and voiceover for, uh, uh, announcing for. And when they lost one of their hosts, they just had me start hosting. So that was kind of the beginning of my career. And back in those days, you know, Nickelodeon, this would have been the late 80s and it easily could have been, you know, the 50s just because it was so, (laughs) comparative to what's going on now, it was just so, you know, it was a blast because no one knew really how to do, you know, a three-hour live show. So we were just throwing in a bunch of stuff, a lot of interviews, games, cartoons. It was a great training ground for me. So I've always been very appreciative of what Nickelodeon did for me for that kind of training. Through all that work and other shows I've done, I've worked with a bunch of different producers and directors who eventually went on to do Parm, and that's kind of how they knew me for that. Because there were a lot of other guys who were much more qualified to do Parm than I was. They were guys who traveled a lot, spoke a lot of languages. But I'd done a bit of TV, and and I think they knew that I wasn't going to be too worried by things going wrong or you know things happening, because that was kind of what my job was for a long time. So I think that's kind of really how I fell into it. It was never a big plan or a big desire to to be in show business really. And even now, you know, I, I, it's not a big deal to me to do it or to not do it. Just It was something that was very fun. And that particular show in particular was really fun to do. And, you know, but I enjoyed that. So I, it's a long-winded answer, I, I guess, for your question. No. I have the worst interview, by the way, of all time. So, you know, no, you're fine. I'm pretty bad interviewee. <laughs> you're fine. You're fine. Don't worry about it. Oh, well, thanks. It's so weird. You you were coaching kids on TV all those years, and suddenly I'm coaching you. We talk about full circle. Right. Oh, absolutely. Yes. And, and you, you were trying to get me to work Skype today, and we thought what a disaster that was. That's like the uh, out of my wheel, man. My wheelhouse can't pull it off. My <laughs> nephews are always yelling about me about that too because they can't pull it off. Ever. Oh well. I don't want to know how to work. Well, oh, it's fine. Uh, but, um, you know, staying with the Nickelodeon theme, you actually worked for many years. In fact, dare I say, you cut your teeth in the game show world working behind the scenes on Double Dare, which I believe is the only children's game show that ran longer than Carmen. So, uh, can you just briefly talk about your experience on Double Dare? Oh, that's, oh yeah, that's great. But I can't believe you know all that stuff. I, 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 only, um, I only came to Double Dare, I think, the last year when Nickelodeon went down to... Um, Florida, I, we were doing the last year of uh, Total Panic at that time, so that's when I ran into, I think that's when I ran into Mark Summers and all that gang down there, and so then as we were transitioning out of that show, Nickelodeon was trying to find another show for me to do, so I did some more warm-up down there, and, excuse me, a couple of pilots, and then I did uh, did some of the warm-up, yeah, for the, I think it was the last year of them, I thought they did five years, you probably are up to date better than I am on that, I thought they did five years as well, but I could be wrong on that. Um, so it was the last year then, and they were always so good to me. Mark Summers was always really good to me with advice and how to do stuff, and Anna Calderwood and all those guys, and the Hugh. Um, I'm not blanking on Hugh's last name, but anyway, um, just great people down there who really gave me a lot more experience and a lot of advice on stuff and very helpful. And then when we couldn't find anything that really stuck, and that's when I came back up to New York City and uh, kind of banged around for a short time before the auditions for Carmen started. So then I went over there and gave that a whirl. But yeah, Double Dare was a blast. That was really fun because it was, uh, you know, when, the, when the Universal Studios first opened up, a lot of these live audiences that would come through all day. And so I would do a couple of different shows, either hosting or semi-hosting. 
I'm sure it's around somewhere. But uh, before <laughs> before you were on Carmen, uh, you were kind of were on PBS very briefly a little bit. You were on a Sesame Street uh, Firehouse special. Yeah. Do you remember anything <laughs> about that? Oh, dude, I completely... I forgot about that. I can't believe you had found that. Good grief. Be scared me, man. Uh, <laughs> yeah, I think it was the one... Uh, I think it was a... I, I believe it was, but they. I, I believe it was, but they aired on PBS uh, time and again. I think during pledge oh, okay, drives okay, usually. Yeah, uh, yeah Sesame Street goes to the firehouse. I think I was in that as one of the, for the firemen. <laughs> Rode on the back of the uh, fire truck with Big Bird. As both of us were pretty sure we we're going to fall off and kill ourselves. And I won't tell you all the stuff that was happening <laughs> back there, but it was pretty, it was quite funny, hilarious. Huh. With Carol and it was pretty cool. So. Yeah, they, all those guys, I gotta say, all those people, especially back in the New York State, all those guys are just, everybody that worked on those shows were so cool and so nice, and uh, it's just a really great place for a work from uh, Nebraska to show up and just to be, fall, literally fall into those, 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 a lot of really nice good people who were willing to help and give you a shot at stuff, and you know, kind of had the, uh, I guess it's kind of like how, how people are these days with podcasting or... Uh, YouTube, I guess, you know, where all you guys are kind of figuring this stuff out and, you know, we're all, all kind of finding out how it works and how this how this goes. And I think it was, in many ways, it was like that for me anyway, uh, back in those days, too. Oh, I, I'll tell you this, man, I never thought anybody would ever be bringing it up 30 years, 20 years later. <laughs> well, I, mean, I just, I figured, yeah, I just figured it right well, off of the sunset. Well, I had to do my homework. Yeah, this is like a big weird, interview. <laughs> yeah, it's very weird, man. It's very I don't know. I always do from high school. I thought I'd never see you again. Oh, yeah, what's going on? Man? I can't see that. Whatever. It's weird. Uh, That's uh, good. It's weird. Uh, all right. Let's uh, get to why we're actually here. How did you first hear about Carmen, and how did you get to audition for it? Well, it was just a, it was just a regular. After um, stuff that Nickelodeon didn't quite, for another show, never quite panned out. We did a couple of pilots, like I say, and a few of the same. Uh, then I just came back up to New York and just started on the. Uh, by that time, I decided, oh, I guess I'm an actor. I guess I'm, I guess I'm in this business right now. You know, because I'd already been doing it for a few years. And so then my agent, just, you know, heard about the audition in the normal way, and I'm not sure how they did it back then. But they said you need to cut your hair and you need to just uh, put on a suit and go over there and do this thing. So I think they had, they they would probably tell me something different. But I think they had 300 guys that were looking at for that. Gig. And like I said, they were wanting them to be more, you know, kind of world traveled and they spoke some languages that was good. None of those things I had, had ever done. I basically had been to Nebraska and New York City. That's basically my, my run. But I had done this other work, you know. So it finally got whittled down to the final three guys. They were, you know, one of the guys, especially, was very experienced on television and his hosting. And another guy was very talented. And I'm a little bit dyslexic, and I know a lot of people say that, but I, I really am, and so it's hard for me to read some of the cards, which, as you can imagine, for um, San Diego can be a bit of a mess because of the names and the countries and the, oh, my gosh. But I, don't, I would have trouble reading some of that stuff, like, in a major way. So I was trying to run the game and do the stuff, but my biggest problem with all the auditions, even with the show itself, was, was getting through the pronunciation of the words with the kind of a major deal so we had that final audition with all the big shots you know from PBS and all that stuff and I guess it I guess it went well enough I know Vince Harris who eventually became my wife Vince Lee who played uh, I think her title on the show was Word Queen she was like the smarty pants on there who uh, my wife speaks a lot of languages and so she was the one that you know helped us you know figure out where the, how the maps would change and uh, basically how to say all the words how to sell so she was the one person who didn't want to hire me for that job and the other producers who I'd worked with before it did and so she had to eventually start working with me on how to read those words so that's the only reason I got through it <laughs> well, it was just a regular audition we got done the last three guys for some reason you know uh, against her wishes maybe some other people decided to give me a shot at it so it was fun at least you got through it so that's the important thing got through it yes and then the, and then the first uh, that first season which you can always tell the first season because that's when I'm wearing the different colors of coats once we get to the blue coats that's year two through year five it's the red coat or I think maybe an orange coat and that's all the first season 
And the first season was when we still didn't really know what we were doing. You know, we were still changing the game sometimes on a daily basis. And I think kids, parents mad at me because I was reading the clues too long for the big math part, you know. But, but, well, we'll talk about all that in just a little second. But before we get into the actual production of the show, around the same time, you had a recurring role on Doug. You were playing the mayor slash principal. So how were you able to juggle that as well as your Carmen San Diego gig? Oh, well, it was, uh, you know, it was, um, the thing about Carmen was we only did a few weeks out of the year, you know. We would do, uh, towards the end there, we would do, we tried to do five shows a uh, a day and then I also had a show on ESPN2 called um, called uh, what was that called brother uh, I can't remember the name of it it was like one of the first video music guys crashing on ski shows what was that thing called oh, I would do Carmen during the day for that and then I would do the ESPN show at night and then we would go on the weekends we'd, do the, we'd travel on the you know go out and travel he just kind of worked it all in, but at least with Parman, it kind of would die out, you know, after uh, a few weeks, and then and then usually Doug was on another, you know, another schedule, and I didn't have that much to do for Doug. I did Mayor White, Principal White, so you would just kind of come in and do your few lines, and then you could you could go. So um, that was usually a lot easier to do, and usually it land on the same days or same weeks. Why am I to do it? I can't remember what the ESPN show is right now. Good thing you call me. I'm going down very quickly. So. <laughs> no, it's fine. Um, I'll help you out. But um, in the meantime, what was that very first season? What was it like an adjustment period for everybody? Because I have to imagine that everything didn't go as smoothly as the camera would otherwise suggest. Oh, you're exactly. Oh, dude, it was a mess. And I mean, that in a fun, horrible way. I mean, it was just it was a complete. We had everybody there. We had Lynn Thigpen. She was over there in her office. And then I had my stuff going on here trying to read my, my card and doing that poorly. We had the maps that were already... We have one map that's on the other side of the studio. And you would have to do all of it. It could be United States or whatever it was going to be. And so the biggest thing was that we were still kind of learning how to game play and all that work. And we just kind of shot it as close to live as we could. So there was a lot of running around and stuff that, that happened that, that first year. And... Just changing the rules a lot about when you would pull the chain, you know, to put the criminal in jail. That was not always the same. How you would, you know, do the three things with the loot and the power that worked. I don't know, well, what is it, dude? It's the loot. <laughs> Something else. Like, what are those three things? How are we going to change those around? So a, a, lot of that, a lot of those rules kept changing. I know one of the biggest ones we got in trouble, I think got in trouble, we were rightfully upset about. <laughs> when we first started, on the big map, you know, I, they would have me give three clues to where the kid had to run to, you know, with the big poles yeah, you know, with, the, right. with the markers. Uh -huh. So I would say, you know, this place uh, is known for its coffee and blah, 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 and the fiesta, blah, 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 blah. go to Peru. Well, the whole time I'm reading, like, clues, I'm eating at this poor kid's time. Yeah, <laughs> right. Standing there with a marker going crazy. I'm reading it as fast as I can. We did that for a few shows and then, the, you know, it was obvious to everybody that he just he totally was unfair because we were not giving the kid enough time to run with the with the marker. So it was that kind of changes that we had to change. And also that first year was when the uh, Soviet Union broke up, right? Right. And so I, I remember the night coming, or the morning coming to work pretty early and everybody had all of our fantastic crew and everyone who worked on all the sets and every set crew we had to repainting maps all night because now they were trying to find out where the different countries went where the different new things that had sprung up basically overnight you know so it was that kind of uh, thing that hit us in that first year so it took us at least a year or two to kind of get a real good flow going where it was kind of like a and I mean this in a good way but kind of like a factor where we could really bang these shows out efficiently and well and, but that first year was a bit of a was a bit of a mess by the way, that ESPN show you hosted was called Max Out, I believe. Oh, how did you find it? Did you, did you Google that thing on your computer and you got not... Multitasking, man. It's what I do. How did you find that? You maxed out. That was it, boy. I know it was one of those weird 80s kind of words. Yeah, that was fun. That was another fun show. Because that was like, uh, I think that was one of the first ones they had with a bunch of TV monitors around, a smoke machine, and the camera kind of going on in and out. And, you know, we would have these new bands come on, mostly rock and roll, a few rap guys, but mostly rock and roll guys that no one had ever heard of, and they'd hook them together with, uh, they'd make their own videos, basically, for ESPN. So, yeah, we do about, we do two or three shows of that at night, and about five carmen's during the day. But those were, those were full days, back in those days. But it, it was 
Yeah. Uh, all right. Back to Carmen. When did you catch on that this was such a huge success and it was probably going to be around for a while? Well, that's a great question because I think the first year, you know, you never think anything's going to happen. And I certainly didn't think they were going to keep me because I couldn't read my cards. You know, I couldn't, you know, it was just such a disaster that I just can't read very well. Um, and so I think for me, probably on the weekends, we start doing the live shows. I think one of the first ones we did, we went back to Pittsburgh, which was one of the one of the uh, produced PBS stations was, was there. I think they had 10,000 people at this mall for us with the, all the gang there. They were giving away computers. It was a mess. And that was the first time probably that I had realized it was pretty popular at that time. You got 300 kids in the audience there and they're excited and the contestants are excited, which is fun to kind of go out or go to school visit or something. You start to figure out how much that means to people. So it's probably one of those first ones of those that kind of dawned on me that it was that was kind of resonating and, you know I always liked the, one thing I really liked about opera fans you know and not to put down other people's fans but I always I think a lot of us felt this way that we kind of had a we had a smart bunch of kids I mean our kids were like smart you know they would call themselves nerdy or whatever but I was like they were really smart cool kids who kind of had a lot going on they always had something cool to give you or something to show you or to tell you about. And probably like you were too, you know, you would have little kids, you know, little guys who you thought were out of the range of the show, couldn't possibly understand what was going on, showing up in their um, shoe outfits and their hats and their trench coats and stuff. And that was, I think, when it really started to dawn on me that that was going on. And not to surprise anybody here, but you know, obviously back in those days, you didn't have everything we've got now. And so you, there was no real, aside from fan mail, there was no real way that you really knew. I mean, you had, you had ratings for television, but you didn't know unless you went out there and saw people and heard from them. So that was really, I guess, the way that, that dawned on me, I think, for the first time. Yeah, can you talk a little bit about this trailing show? Because I, I pulled up an old article uh, about you that was written in the L.A. Times many years ago, and uh, you, you said it's a modified version of the TV show. So uh, how is it different from what we saw on TV? Oh, well, well you know, we didn't usually have uh, the Rockefeller guys or, or Lynn. Most of the time it was just me going out there, you know, which was people over the initial disappointment it was just me. And then they would kind of... Uh, enjoy the show and stuff but usually we had a great uh, Trish Meyer traveled with me most of the time she was just kind of a one woman uh, wrecking crew as far as producer of uh, Fantastico I mean she she could just get everything going everything working we had a great little set that would fold up and fly off and so we'd have our three podiums we'd have something to put up in the back we'd give away some cool prizes we'd have three dumb shoes there we'd win some contests and the you know, work to try to get up there. So again, you've got kids who want to be there, who work to get there, just like on the show, which I think makes a difference. You know, they're not just putting their name in the hat, but they're working the past test to get there. And, um, and occasionally, I think once or twice when they've had Rockefeller there, I know we had uh, the chief there a couple of times. But mostly it was just me, and we would, we would work in, sometimes people from the PBS station or local teachers or local kids who would come through and give our clues. You know, they'd be, you know, they'd have a, opera hat on, you know, singing some, singing some opera, you know, we just had our little gags that we would do. It was like a little half hour show, pretty much. People loved it, and they showed up for it, and the kids were fantastic, and, you know, it was the closest thing that a kid who was living in Des Moines going to have, you know, being on that show, and it was exciting. I mean, it was, it was always a fun thing. And again, like you said before, I mean, that's when I, that's when I was able to see that people we're really into it. So we do autographs and stuff afterwards and meet everybody. And I think just like now, it was always a little bit surprising to me, a little bit shocking and, and just very gratified and feel lucky to somehow be in that mix of something that means something to people. So nothing that I did, but I'm just happy to be uh, there for a good seat to see it happen. Now, I'm looking at this article, and uh, this, this is the last question I'll have about the traveling show. Uh, it says here that this would have fit me like a glove at that time. There was something called a junior gumshoe segment on the live shows for people under five. So that, can you tell me what that was about, and can you tell me how little Jeffrey probably would have uh, fared on that? <laughs> you would have been a classic junior gumshoe. First, Jeffrey, i got to tell you, this is... Uh 
you're a very good interviewer, man. I mean, the, the, I had no idea that you were going to do so much research. A lot of times when I do, these people don't even know what, what we're talking about half the time. You're very good. Man. I'm going to start listening to your podcast. I'm a big podcast listener. I'm going I'm to get your show and start, start listening to it. Anyway, uh, yeah, the Little Jeffrey would have been perfect for this. This is something that I put in because I wrote a lot of stuff for the show itself. I wrote whenever Greg would go into Glenn's office, I wrote a lot of those things. And then I would I wrote the, uh, the live show too. And this was something that I kind of pulled from my old um, audience warm-up days, which is when I would just kind of interview little kids, you know, and just get them to say funny stuff and just kind of, uh, you know, ask them what they did for a living and that kind of thing. And we just kind of messed around with kids. And sometimes they would freeze up and see nothing, but most of the time they would end up pack dancing or doing somersaults or something exciting that would, you know, kill a few more minutes of this live show in a mall. So people enjoy it, and I enjoy doing it. It's always good for a laugh, you know. So, um, yeah, our junior gum shoe, we bring them out there. I forget how we had them, but it was a, it was a similar thing of we would have a room of them, and I'd try, I'd, you know, I'd go to talk to the parents and try to figure out who was going to be good and chanty and yakky up there. So, yeah, we talked to a few of those. That was basically all it was, though. So kind of a... I think they used to do that show, uh, Kids Say the Darndest Things, so it's kind of based on that, I guess. All right, well, that's really nice. So, you get to the second season. Have you pretty much settled into a routine as far as production by the end of the TV show? Well, yeah, by the second season, it was much, much more on the, I would say, by the third year especially is when we really started cranking on it. it, it by the year two or three is when we really started figuring out okay Lynn Lynn the chief doesn't need to be here all day for her parts that she does so let's and she was doing a lot of film and television by, uh, episodic stuff and then too not, she'd been doing it before but she was getting busy with some other stuff then so let's shoot all of her stuff before anything so always every season when we come back that's the first thing we would always do is uh, all of Lynn's stuff uh, they would just shoot her in her office by herself. That's all we had. And then I would come in and I would do scenes with her that I had. They call they used to call those Gilos, G I L O, which is Greg and Lynn's office. And the names of those gags were. So our writers would do those, and I would write a bunch of those too. And we would come in, we'd shoot all of her stuff. She would do all of her tags, all of her intros, all of her those, everything she would do. And then she was she would be done after. Maybe a week of shooting with her, I would say. I don't think it was more than that. So she would do that, she'd be done. And then when we started actual production, then we found out that the maps were kind of its own thing. So we would do round one and round two of all the games, usually five shows a day. So we bring everybody in and uh, let's go to the map. And then that would be the end. And then we'd say goodbye to that kid and then that kid would come back, you know, maybe a month and a half later to do that final round. Now, Jeffrey, you can only imagine what happens when you send an 11-year-old, 10-year-old kid away for six weeks. I know, I have to wonder. Right. Yeah, many things can happen, and many things did happen. They would come back with different haircuts, with sunburns, with poison ivy. <laughs> one time in particular, I remember one kid came back with a, with a busted arm with a big old cast on her arm. <laughs> so, at the end of the round two, we would say, let's go to the map, and have the chief doing her thing and then we'd come back to me and the kid running under the map and that's a big old cast and a different haircut it was hilarious it was fantastic now that's kind of a good segue into my next question you know there was one episode that never aired because there was a gumshoe while running the map. She fell and broke her arm and the runner up had to come and take her place do you know anything about that can you give us a little story about that particular episode I I mean pretty much that was that was got all the detail that's pretty much all all it was it was it was horrible it was uh i felt so bad for the kid you know i haven't worked in nickelodeon and a bunch of other stuff you know uh kids camp and all this stuff you know over the years i'm telling you the fans of the show were a different breed of kid i really dug these kids a lot because they were smart and they worked hard and they knew stuff and it was just heartbreaking for all of us you know who who saw that happen and yet you know that was all we could do now i can't remember I can't remember if they made some sort of, uh, you know, gave her another, I'm, I'm imagining they would give her some kind of prize for that. Uh, you know, she just worked so hard to get there, she earned the right to be there, and then that kind of stuff happened. And that was probably always the, um, for me, that map part was for, the way I always looked at it, it's when I became the kid's teammate, and I'm on the kid's side, I want to really try to help them get the 
of thing. So when she fell, I remember that uh, how bad I felt, just like any, any other teammate would feel, you know. That's about all that I can remember of that particular story. I remember they used to get, um, I used to get charged sometimes in a nice way, but they would say, Greg, you're pointing to the country with your foot and you can't do, you can't, you can't be helping them that much. You can't be getting back up. And I, and I wouldn't do it on purpose, but I would just, you know, I just leave you trying hard to help get you to the, to the gig, you know, so whatever. Let's talk about some of the uh, actual segments involved with the show. And the first one I want to talk about is how did the Chief's Office sketches halfway through the first round come to be? Was it meant to just be a comedy break, or was it somebody's idea to have that happen? What was the deal with those? Because those were, dare I say, hilarious. Oh, thanks, man. I appreciate that a lot. You know, it kind of um, it definitely evolved, you know. I think one of the biggest changes that happened Sometime after the first year, probably. And I have to say that the Lynn at that time was known as a, as a great actress and she did a lot of big dramas and she was very, you know, she had that stern way about her. But there was something that, and I know other people pick up on this too, but I definitely picked up on it. I said, Lynn Thigpen is hilarious. This, this woman is really funny. And I, I remember saying, I think we got the emphasis on the characters wrong for comedy. Because at the first year, I always was that Greg was this idiot. And the chief was the stern person who was always yelling at him. I said, well, there's something to that. But to really make that funny, you've got to put the chief in some of these situations where he's kind of dancing around her and she's, she can't quite keep track of what's going on. And you've got her in these, you know, in boxing gloves or, you know, beard on her face or whatever it is. You know, you, you've got her in these situations that this crazy office has put her in. I said, because she, because Lynn is, is a comedic actress. She's hilarious. Because of this gravitas that she carries, you know, that's really what funny is all about to me, is that you can have this fool running around, but the great character is more like what kids should be. That's kind of the kid's character. That's who the kids are going to be kind of looking through the eyes of. Lynn's going to be more of the authority figure to let her deal with him and deal with the kids that way. Right? Does that make any sense? Does that make any it, sense? It, yeah, it makes total I mean, sense. Go ahead. To me, that's what the, what the comedy part of it is, and and I think when people realized, not everybody did, but I think people realized that the jokes really are with Lynn, with her reaction, with her stuff. And because she was such a great actress, she's able to pull that off and still keep her authority and still keep her in charge of this, you know. I mean, that's, 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 her, that's her thing. And, and she's hilarious. I mean, she's so funny and such a wonderful friend to me. I mean, she was just such a good person and great friend of mine. And, um, she was just hilarious. And so, yeah, I think over, after the first year or so is when those started, started to be, and we started realizing, you know, here's an opportunity to kind of break this show up again, have some gag, do some stuff, you know, get rid of, do the business we've got to get done too. But I really wish more people realized how funny she, she really was, because she was really good about that. And the, I, to me, the reason those worked uh, is because of her, you know. I'm the dork running around, but she's the one that makes those things really work reaction and all that stuff is, is the gig I mean look her reaction this, to me this is a high compliment some of her reactions were you know all of her hearty words which to me is a huge compliment I mean that to me Ricky Gervais talks about the, all of her hearty I mean it, that stuff uh, that I can take that hit and do that reaction to camera is what makes those work so I'm, I'm glad you I'm glad you thought that and, and because uh, that was certainly the intent and I, I always think she's the reason those work anyway can you talk, tell me about your relationship with her, both on and off camera, because it seemed like your chemistry really developed as the show went on. Oh, yeah. She, you know, when she came in, when we both came in, I mean, I was, uh, you know, I was basically the warm-up guy, you know, who was horsing around and entertaining audiences. And, you know, I didn't have a lot of background in, in anything. And like I said before, it wasn't like a big lifelong dream of mine to be on camera or on stage or anything. I was just kind of killing some time to figure out what else I wanted to do. She, on the other hand, was an award-winning actress that we had somehow scored to do this show. And she had a rock and roll with the stars of the show and Tom and Gord. I was just kind of the guy facilitating stuff. But she was our big star, you know. And so I think it took her a little while. <laughs> well, it didn't take her very long at all to realize, you know, that I didn't know what I was doing. I hadn't done any of this stuff. I think the one thing that impressed her probably early on was that she realized, especially that first season, the 
because of the warm up experience I had, when things would just went haywire, you know, which they did all all that first season, it just didn't really bother me too much. And I assumed I was gonna get fired anyway, so that did you know, whatever. You don't keep this job anyway. So I think in spite of my lack of experience, I think she respected that probably. I respected her because of her great talent and experience and I learned a lot so much from her, you know. But we just get to be really good friends and so, you know, when we were in New York we'd go over there when she was coming to Los Angeles. Once we came out here she would stop by the house and go to dinner, whatever. You know, she was just always a really good, generous friend of mine. And when she died, uh, I can't think how many years it's been. Two thousand three. Two thousand three. She yeah. died. Two thousand three. Good grief. That just seems un- unbelievable to me that long. You know, it was devastating. I mean she was uh Actually, just because she was doing that show, um, I guess I need more coffee this morning, dude. Uh, what's the last show she was doing? The, 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 the District, I think it was called. And uh, I, there's no help from her, I just want to say, but I had gone, I'd gone there, I had done an episode of that, with, uh, not with her, but she was there, and I was doing it with Greg D. Nelson. And I think that was the last time I saw her. And then shortly after that, after I did that episode, then she, uh, you know, had that aneurysm and just kind of died. And it was just, no one saw, saw that coming. No one wanted that to happen, obviously. And it was just, that was a, that was a hard one because she's a very good friend of mine. All, all those people that worked on that show are just, they're just always been good people, good friends. That I stay in touch with for, uh, quite, quite a bit. I, now, the Rockefeller guys, I don't see too much of anymore. Sean and I run on each other every once in a while. But, um, yeah, all good people. Uh, and I'll, I'll talk about Rockapella in just a little bit, but let me just ask you a little bit about the persona that you took on. Uh, who was Greg Lee on camera and who was Greg Lee off camera during the show? <laughs> what do you mean? I'm a, what do you mean? What does that mean? You kind of adopted like a, a goofy yet likable persona on camera, but uh, did you take yeah. more of a serious side off camera? Did you, were you trying to keep the gumshoes in line because let's face it they probably all dealt with being on TV a little bit differently were you more serious off camera were you more, were you goofier off camera um, how was your uh, persona in both ways well, uh, that's, a, that's a great question okay I see uh, well, well I think primarily for me and this is not uh, atypical I think for a lot of performers I'm not really an extroverted person I'm absolutely an introverted person who pretends to be extroverted for money on occasion Okay. You know, how, you know, once in a while I'll do it, you know, but, but it's not like something that, um, like I have a lot of performer friends of mine who they only live when they're on stage and I get that and that's fine and whatever, but that is not me. I'm, I'm much more, um, I can get very tired after performing because it kind of takes a lot of energy for me because I'm kind of, you know, I like to read, I like to ride my bike, I like to, you know, do my thing. I'm not one of those guys that has to be on all the time. I, I think the biggest thing about hosting a show though and even though this had a lot of other elements in it ultimately my job was to kind of traffic you know the show and keep things rolling and keep things moving keep the kids keep them calm and you know relaxed and having a good time so I think off camera you know I'm clearly not that character but I mean um, I certainly enjoyed doing it and I think I probably just brought in more of my audience warm up stuff to that job but not probably as big as I used to do warm up just because you had to kind of keep uh on things and keep things rolling. I think it was, was that Mark Summer, somebody said to me once, they said that, that the host can never be bigger than the show. And I think that is true. I think when you have a host that's a little bigger than the show, the balance is off a little bit. And I think I always knew that I kind of had my gig that I did. But I'm not the star of the show. You know, the problem is the star of the show, the kids are the star of the show, Land, Rocket, I'm really not the main dude here. I'm kind of the guy that you see all the time the emphasis really is on these cool kids, you know, this stuff, doing this thing, and, you know, whatever. There's a lot of other elements that are happening. And I think if you can keep up, you can realize that and be okay with it. Because I think some performers, you know, that would bother a lot. They would, you know, that they would want to have more of a whatever, more of a role or more of a emphasis. For me, for me, it was just my gig, my little part that I had to do for this. And I think that's okay. And I think you're hosting a show, I think that's kind of more where you need where you need to be with it. So I guess uh, uh, that's different. I, I guess to put it, in, in many ways, I don't know that I'm that goofy off camera. Maybe I am. I don't think so, though. 
I think I'm quieter than that. <laughs> Talk a little bit about Rockapella because you talked with them on camera a lot. So tell me about your relationship with them during the entire production of the show. Well, I mean, again, another coup, I think, for that show was bringing these, these guys who were singing a cappella. I mean, even back then, you said that, and they would say, well, why would you, why would anyone want to do that? And yet these guys made it so cool and so fantastic and such talented guys that usually what comes with that, not usually, but oftentimes what comes with great talent like that, I think is, you know, some people who are kind of hard to work with. And those guys just aren't. They're just all charming, hilarious, generous people. I mean, it's just kind of, I know I keep hitting the same note with this man, but I'm just telling you, this is why this, of all the jobs I've had, this is the one that had meant the most to me because this was a special kind of gig that was going on. Special kind of people. And these guys were just, you know, they were always there. They always hit their mark. They always did this thing. And then they had these, just these gems of things that they would come up with it was just amazing. Oftentimes our writers, you know, would come up with how to work close to it and they would pull it together. I mean, I remember when they did that. And this was a collaborative thing that they had so much to do with it with the Beatles thing where they would, they ended up having the Beatles uh, cover at the end of the song. You know, they had, they looked just like them and they shot it just a certain way. But to have that huge thing in your arsenal of rock and pal, it was just a whole nother thing. To say nothing about the theme song that, that Sean and those guys wrote. You just don't get that all the time. And to have them be good guys is yet another thing that doesn't happen <laughs> very often. Yeah, it seemed like they were very natural performers because oftentimes they would, you know, play all these goofy characters. You had Scott Leonard as the dying informant. You had Barry Carl dressing in drag as Mrs. <laughs> Pumpkin Clanger. So, um, <laughs> just name a couple. But, um, but was it easy for them to uh, just step into any role and just act as something different from what they were? I think most of them, I won't say who didn't, but I would say most of them, the great majority of them really enjoyed doing that kind of stuff. There were maybe one or two that, wasn't, that weren't as crazy about dressing up and stuff. But I would say most of them, let's say three, okay, two, really <laughs> loved doing that and loved the fact that it was something different to do and mess around with. You know, sometimes you're not in the mood to do, you know, some of that stuff. And I do think that, you know, those guys had the potential and, and are, you know. Like, Lynn was a real, legitimate actor. Those guys are real, legitimate singers and performers who do their own music. They do. Um, if you ever, ever have a chance to see the show, because I think Scott is still... Scott still has Rockapella. I actually did see Rock, Rockapella uh, for their Christmas concert last year, and they did sing the theme song at the end, which was fantastic, by the way. So yeah, oh great, yeah. I mean, I mean, and even when they were together, the, the original guys would go out and do. It. I mean, you know, the show is as good as anybody else's show. I mean, it's fantastic. It's top notch, and so it's not too often you're going to get. Again, people of that caliber who are going to put on a big banana suit and run across and read a clue, <laughs> you know, and still be able to go back then and be real performers but um, I think they were able to pull it off and I think um, while at that time it may have been for some you know it may not have been as exactly what they wanted to be doing I think over the years you know we, we over the years we've all just, you know seen how important that was to people and what it meant to people and how they could still be great performers and do some of that stuff too so you know time see how, how things change now, the contestants were all New York City school kids, but you know, you talked a little bit about how some of them came back from the map, after, or for the map, rather, after several weeks, but um, were there any contestants that really stood out to you during all your time doing the show for whatever reason? Mm, well, I don't know. There's just so many of those. I mean, there were... Boy, that's a good question. I'm just trying to think if there was... I guess the one guy that I always... And I guess there were so many of them, but there was one guy that I always think of. He got to the <laughs> he got to the end of the map, right? Yes. He wins the map. Uh -huh. and so before we before we do the map, they write down where they want to go, right? Right. And, and so he'd written down where he wanted to go. He won. The place is going crazy. The music, the confetti, whatever that got going on. Kids are going crazy. He's excited. I'm excited. Okay, Johnny, I'm getting back. Um, before you know, you ran this map. So you wrote 
down where you want to go, and you want to go too. And I open the little folder, and it says Iowa. <laughs> <laughs> and I mean, dude, I'm telling you, you've never heard 300 kids just boo another kid. Oh, they were so <laughs> mean. They were booing the camera guys. Were bad. And I was like, oh, Iowa, okay. something like that would happen. And when they say anywhere in North America, you'd think they'd say anywhere in North America is acceptable, but apparently not. I know, Jack. There are several places you may not go. Iowa is one of them. You'll have to meet your grandmother in California. <laughs> I probably would have said Montana myself, but that's a whole other yeah, story. Yeah, there you go. See, see, exactly. I like guys who think themselves go where they want to go. Look at the audience. Oh, you want to go? Actually, I probably said Montana because one of the episodes I had on tape, that was one of the places that you went to for the jail time challenge where it was wheeled down to two and they had the memory type game. So, I don't know. I thought it was interesting when I saw the photo slideshow. But, um, yeah. anyway, other than that, I'm sure, traumatic experience for that contestant, um, <laughs> Were there any other moments on camera that really stand out to you during your time there? Stuff that made it into the show, I might add. Uh, well, I think, I think one of the ones, that, two things I always hear about from everybody, and these are, you know, old time shoes who are, you know, still will, will say things. They will always, and so I think because they say it, that I, that I think of this probably, but most of them will always talk about, I think it was two times we went off, it sounds so quaint now but at the time I guess it was kind of a, a deal <laughs> there were times a couple of times when I would go off the set like into the cameras you know so that the kids could see you know backstage or how things were laid out you know you know, you know what I'm talking about where I would walk out of yeah. the office yeah I think so into the cameras across to where the audience was and, and we had a couple of a couple of scenes you know where I would be talking to myself you know in my head yeah. yeah, but I think one time, and I've seen this one on YouTube actually, where Sean, where I chased Sean around with a, a snowball. I think he's doing the chase. He yeah. The snowball, we chase him around. People always talk about when you go off off camera, they like that. And then this one is even more. I get this all the time. They say, my favorite part of that show, they say, Greg, you know the favorite part of the show? I said, the Matt, no. The favorite part of the show is when, when the kid would put the bad guy in jail after the second round when they pull that chain yeah yeah now, was, that a, was that a thing for you I liked it but um it, it, it wasn't your top favorite thing of the show <sighs> oh boy that's uh, <laughs> but, I mean, but I mean the, the chain thing was not yours uh, was right right yeah I mean it, it was just something that happened it was it was part yeah. of every show so I didn't think much of it right you would be amazed how many people tell me that was their favorite part of the show but we bring out the, the if something like there's something about the live chain connecting the cartoon cage. You know what I'm saying? Yeah, That's exactly. Something. Yeah. <laughs> and, and and we were kind of when we did it, we thought the same as you. We thought, well, this is part of the show, but this is how we're going to put. I'm telling you, man. A lot of people say that was their favorite part, and, and I and I think I, I think I get that because I remember as a kid I used to watch a Popeye cartoon, but there was this kid that would walk in to see a Popeye cartoon in a movie. And he took out the, a can of real spinach and he threw it into the cartoon and Popeye caught it, cartoon spinach, and ate it. And I remember as a kid thinking, that's the greatest thing in the world. 
it's, so maybe it's that kind of connection. Cartoon real life connection. I'm Greg Lee with Cartoon Therapy. <laughs> That's something. I don't even know what, why am I getting off on that topic, but there's something to that. Is what I'm saying. So a kid connects what real life the cartoons. There's something there. I don't know. It, it probably has something to do with animation. Kids love cartoons. It kind of adds up. Yeah. But, uh, but, um. You're kind of in it. You're kind of in it then. Right. So, this is probably something you didn't think about for many, many years. But, uh, after President Obama was getting ready to get inaugurated for the second time, there's a clip that surfaced online of you talking to then Senator Joe Biden, uh, right before the, the, the phone call from Wonder Rat, I believe it was. So, you probably didn't think much of it at the time, but looking back on that particular moment years later, what was going through your mind when you realized, hey, I talked to the future vice president? Well, I, I, here, I wish I would have known he was going to be the future vice president. Cause I didn't know that. Um, I did like Joe Biden back in those days. Uh, I thought he was a good guy. You know, I like, He was known for his plain spoken politics at that time. So we got a lot of, uh, we got a lot of celebrities at that time on this show. So it was, I can't say it was surprising. It was, it, we all thought it was kind of cool that we had a, a politician, but you know, it was probably, frankly, it was probably one of the least uh, popular for the kids because they didn't know or care who he was. I didn't care less that they liked some of the other people we had on there. But I remember the adults on you. We all thought that was kind of cool that he would that he would do that. We had a guy named Norm Abram that I uh, probably don't remember him. He used to do this. I guess he's still on PBS. <laughs> he's a building guy. You know, he used to be you know this old house. So we got Norm on there one time just because the. Um, well, he did some gag for us. But, um, no, you're right. As the years have gone on, I have thought about that lately, and I've actually seen that clip, and I remember thinking, that was kind of cool. It reminds me of the one time um, on Nickel on Total Panic, we had Walter Cronkite come on with his grandson one. Oh. No kids knew who he was either, you know, and, and uh, he came on to sharpen pencils, I think is what he was going to do. We did, made no mention of it, we made no big deal about who he was. He came on sharpen the pencils and left. I do like that. Yeah, that's pretty cool. So, obviously, I, I was a freaking test, and it's only one kid's going to get a chance to play for that trip. And even fewer people went on to win the uh, map. So, I guess when you're in that age range, like 8 to 13 years old, everybody oh. deals with losing differently. So, oh. were there several moments when you had to uh, calm somebody down because they lost? Oh, yeah. I mean, that happened all the time, man. And, you know, we all felt terrible. I felt particularly terrible because a lot of the reasons because what I said before you know I often at that point of the game I feel like it's teammate you know so I'm trying to do the best I can trying to read as fast as I can as clearly as I can but it's just yeah you're right it's that very tender age and and again I just have to say you know these kids you know they didn't you know put their name in a hat and happen to get picked I mean they worked to get on that show they worked and they worked to do that in math I mean I can't tell you by the, by the second season how many kids would whisper to me as we're standing at the top of the map, right? Yeah. This happened all the time too. They would whisper to me and say, "I've studied the map upside down." Mm -hmm. I, and you, and that may not mean anything to you unless you're thinking about how the kid and I see the map. Yeah. They had to get to run that map upside down. Right. Those are usually kids who would do really well who would tell me, "I've studied this upside down." And dude, how many times have you studied an atlas upside down in your life? I mean, I I have to do this thing. Yeah, these, you know, 10 year olds, whatever they are, are going to that much work. And so when that kid misses the big prize by four seconds, I mean, it killed me. It killed me. It was just, it was never a happy day when they, when they didn't make We just always all up there. Maybe the guys who were giving the trips away didn't feel that bad. You know, we, <laughs> we usually have a win a week, I think, is basically out of all those shows. Uh -huh. That's what it averaged out to. But it didn't happen very often, you know. Yeah, I find it interesting how during that first season you only need seven countries in 45 seconds, but then they upped it to eight for the rest of the run. So, I don't know. I, I thought yeah. that was kind of cruel, but also kind of necessary. <laughs> yeah, yeah, we, yeah, we took agree to that. It was, again, trying to find that perfect, trying to find that thing where it's not too easy and not too hard. And part of the reason, one way it was too hard was me reading too many clues. I mean, if you ever see any of those early shows, you'll be screaming at me. You'll be yelling at me. <laughs> Yeah, 
You don't know. You don't know what it is. How many do you do? How long do you get? How many seconds? One more thing about the Blues again. I read an article recently where a former gumshoe was being interviewed. They talked about how this one kid got in second place. And that kid was, like, so upset that he didn't win. He threw his world band radio constellation prize out of his moving car, so... Oh, no! Oh, you gotta send me that. I gotta read that article. That's hilarious. Yeah, I'll, uh, email it to you. I think it was an AV Club article that came out last spring. But, uh, yeah, I'll, I'll send it to you when we're done here. But how many of your ideas actually got into the show? You talked about how you wrote some of the Chief's Office sketches, but what were some of your other creations that you put into the show that actually made it into the show? I think that was the biggest contribution I had as far as writing goes. I wrote a lot of those and got in. But a lot of the gameplay, you know, I didn't have anything to do with any of the, you know, coming up with any of that stuff. I think it would be more suggestions that may have happened in ease of gaming. The way I always looked at it was, if it's easy for me to explain it, to understand it, it's going to be easy for the kid to get blitz. If I'm not getting, if it's too hard for me to even explain it, you know, it's going to be too hard. Because it, not that the kids are stupid, but it's just, for, for any mass media like that, you want it to be simple and people to get it. And so it has to remain simple. So I, I don't know that I had too much to do with that so much as any more than being the first guinea pig to go through to say, I don't know what you're talking about. That doesn't make sense to me. That's too hard to say, you know. And so that might have been dyslexia. Just, if it's too hard, if any of it's too hard to say, then to me it's going to be too hard. It's going to be too hard for me, A. Then it's going to be too hard for somebody else to understand. But I think, yeah, I think the biggest contribution probably was the Reagan Lynn's office stuff. And I didn't write all of them, but I wrote a good number of them. Now, you were yourself on camera most of the time, but there were times when you yourself would dress up as a clue informant. Uh, I think one <laughs> character you were dressing up as your quote-unquote father, a, a barber, and and then there was another character you played called Acme Man. Am I right in saying that? Acme Man? Man, I, I, I gotta tell you, you need to teach a podcast and interview school, and I'm not even kidding. <laughs> I mean, you really, the, yeah, I'm not kidding. This is very, this is very admirable. If Thanks. No wonder you have fans you're listening to. I'm going to be one of your fans listening to. Right, thank you. Yeah, that's correct. Actually, man, uh, Phil's a barber. We had Greg Dad's detective one point. We had a thing called Joey Joey one time. And then I wrote most of all of those just because I was, uh, you know, by that time, by, I think that was year four or five, something like that. We was just doing a lot more of those. You know, it was just, it was just more, um, more things to do. I was getting a little antsy to do some other stuff, you know. Which again is one of the reasons I like that show so much was because it was not just we weren't just hosting the show, which I again it's fine for people who want to do that. It's never been something that's interesting to me to just host a game show. But with all the other fun stuff in between, it was it, it just it makes it a whole other gig. Now during the shows last year, you were credited as a contributing producer. What was that about? I think it was probably just because I was writing a lot of stuff. Uh -huh. I think that it was probably just something my agent got because I, I was writing a lot of that stuff and probably giving me some ideas for directing it and costuming it and stuff like that. And a lot of that was Acting Man and Bill the Barber and all that kind of stuff to people what you were talking about. Yeah, because that's really when I was doing more of that stuff and then and doing a lot more of the, the GLOs during the lens offices. All right, that's fine. Now, during the last season, could you kind of sense that, you know, it was getting ready to wrap up? Were there signs that you, something was in the air that you probably weren't going to be doing this for much longer? You know what, to, you know, honestly, I don't think so. I think we thought that other years, I think by that year, there was, you know, we had a lot more money for newer sets, like we had a set for Acting Man, we had a set for Bill the Barber. You know, a lot more money was being spent those last few years. So I think I was thinking, oh, man, we're really... Like it. And I think the, um, as I recall, the, the uh, ratings were still really good. And I'm not sure why they switched over, because they went right into um, Fire in Time after that. But I know there was still some go around. I, I'm not sure if I know why it happened. Maybe it had dropped in the ratings enough that uh, they thought they wanted to try something else. I'm not really sure. But I don't think I had a sense of it really till probably the last couple of shows, maybe even. I they knew for sure, of course, when um, on the last show, Sean from Rockefeller who had that big long braid down his back, he wanted Phil the Barber to cut that off live, you know, during that last song. So, <laughs> so when, you, when you're cutting off Sean's braid, it's over. <laughs> That's when you go self-done. Because he would never cut that off otherwise. 
How did you get the official word that the show was going to be no more? I don't remember. My guess is I probably got it from my probably. All right, uh, because, you know, like you said, a couple of years after that, they started wearing time as Carmen San Diego. Were you approached to do that show at all, or were you ready to move on by then? Well, uh, yes to both answers, I would say. Uh, I was asked to do it, and I chose not to, primarily because I knew Lynn was going to do it, which I thought was always good. I really liked what we had going on, though, and I thought it was a mistake to switch it over at that time. I thought we had fans the way it was. We finally got our system down, and um, I don't know. It just didn't. Uh, it wasn't going to be the same show. They weren't going to have like a fellow there. And I think at that time too, we moved from New York to Los Angeles by that time, and I was starting to do news radio. I did news radio and some other to come like that, and I was up for some other things. And so I think I was thinking, well, I need to be out here anyway to, to do that other stuff. But I think more than anything, I just really was in love with the geography show. I just disliked the way that show works. I just liked the detective stuff. I liked the goofiness of it. I liked the guys singing and all that stuff. So I think Lyndon did it. Was that, show, was that next show like two years, I think? I, I believe so. It, I, it sounds about right, because I, I watched that show, too, by the way. Yeah, oh, it was a good show. I, think, I forget the guy who did it. Did Kevin Shindick, who I believe uh, ended up developing the Mad Show on Cartoon Network, so... Oh, fantastic. Yeah, yeah. he's a nice guy. I thought he did a very nice job. And um, the answers were good. But I, I just, yeah, after five years of doing it, you know, well, I think that was enough. And uh, if we're not going to keep doing it, you know, so... Okay. Yeah. It's okay. And just one more thing on the car in front. Um, I had the first album that was based on a TV show. I had that on cassette tape, and the quality is obviously deteriorated from listening to it so much. I know you had a couple of pieces on that, but there's one segment that I didn't understand that I don't really understand now. Supposedly, you were voicing a, a New York subway conductor and that, and you were saying all the service was suspended. I don't understand that at all, so do you think you could shed some light on it? <laughs> I don't know if I can. I really don't know. I don't know if I can, man. I think sometimes Sean, because Sean, I think, uh, one of the producers of that, and I think they were just giving me stuff to mess around with. I think they knew I did some voiceover stuff, and I think they were just playing around. And it's, uh, you know, once you get somebody in there to do some stuff, sometimes you just throw some other stuff at them. I'll be confusing to a fan of the show to wonder why is Greg conducting the yeah, why is he doing that yeah. <laughs> we didn't, we didn't, but we didn't think about that uh, alright so so you're finished with Carmen where does your career go after that you said you said uh, news radio but what, what are some of the more notable stuff that you did uh, radio, soon after I did news radio I did district and a bunch of commercials I did news uh, what else did I do right there just a bunch of different sitcoms, you know, some kind of one-off stuff. I was up for a lot of big stuff at that time. My managers were doing uh, a lot of big stuff. And then I think after maybe five years or so, I kind of got tired of doing that for a while. We moved to San Francisco for a while. I just kind of got tired of, like I said, it was never quite my dream to do that stuff. It was more stuff that I was just enjoying to do. And then kind of stopped enjoying it for a while. So it was kind of packed back into writing. We were in Nashville for a while doing some songwriting. I had a contract in there for songwriting. And then recently came back here. Did some writing now for the, the folks that do Minions. I do some marketing writing over there for Illumination. I think in my old age, I'm starting to feel well, I enjoy performing. And I do some, I still do a show down in Nashville called Token. We do that every once in a while. I do some character stuff for him and some comedy stuff. I think really for me, it's, it's more about trying to find out about writing what I want to do for that because I think it's more at this stage of the game where I'd rather lean into that that, that aspect of it. It's more natural to me and I enjoy it a lot. Which, when I look back at the Carmen day, that's kind of well, I enjoyed hosting it. I really enjoyed writing the stuff that was to me was almost more enjoyable in many ways. And so I, I think that's finally what I started to come back around to. So I think that's where I well, one character that you've done since uh, the show ended, it's probably, I don't know if it's the most noble thing you've done, but it's definitely the one that's been most publicized on the web. You have something called Brother Preacher. Can you talk a little <laughs> about that? Yeah, Brother Preacher. Uh, I did a lot of one-man shows in Los Angeles, too, 
and um, my dad's a preacher, and uh, Brother Preacher is sort of a character my mom used to do to make fun of my dad. So that, <laughs> <laughs> I kind of copied that from her and put some jokes in there, and uh, it kind of has become a thing down south anyway, uh, and um, it just sort of, uh, and it's not completely based on my father, obviously, but there's some things we've been taken from that, and um, he's a good guy. But uh, some of the other fundamentalist preachers that I do, and I've done a lot of shows, and um, actually, Phil the Barber was sort of like he was in some way, that type of thing. And actually, now that I think of it, Phil is the Dutch uh, Christopher White, and similar to that, too. A lot of those guys made that character, they're all from the South, too. So, um, yeah, I still kind of do that stuff, and I've done a lot of shows with him, uh, but it's just, he's just sort of a bumbling, arrogant, intellectually lazy. You're more of, consider yourself more of a writer now, but would you ever consider doing Carmen again if someone called you and said we're reviving the show, we want you to come back? <laughs> probably should point this out that there actually is a niche yet passionate contingent online that would love to see the show back um i'm just going to drop this website how to right now carmen san diego dot info i'm not part of it but there are right. there are a couple people who uh have actually written their own updated fan episodes about the show and they've retained you as a host and they've actually promoted you from senior agent to <laughs> captain in charge of training new recruits so oh my gosh that's hilarious I love it man good for them I you gotta send me whatever link that is please I gotta do this stuff that's fantastic oh yeah I definitely yeah, I will I, I mean these are people who are uh, you're fans not just of Carmen, but of like all these other old timey game shows that are trying to air. They're big Law and Order fans. They're uh, yeah, they, yeah. they've inserted all these other cartoon characters like Alvin and the Chipmunks and and uh, the Pokemon characters as additional singers to Rockapella in uh, in their episodes. So you know it's a uh, it's pretty great. You can tell they put a lot of work into it, and you know it's it's very admirable for them that's, to, to that's see it. Fantastic. I, I'm so, I gotta say, it's still, it just it amazes me the, uh, what people can do with all this. I mean, it's, it's, uh, it's the right thing to do. I support this. I think it's been a good way to tell me. It's been great. It'll be a very good birthday for me. I'll just, I mean, for you. Yeah, but, but, well, it'll be for you in a couple months. May I'll get you back on for your birthday. But, but, um, 
I'm going to turn the questions over to some of the uh, things that other people asked me because, like I said at the top of the uh, interview, before we start recording, actually, I reached out to people to see if they had questions, and they, they had questions. They definitely had questions. So um, some of them have to do with the show. Some of them have nothing to do with the show, and, and not even you. But, you know, I, I made them a promise. So <laughs> the questions you haven't answered so far, I'm going to answer. And I'm going to start with one from my mom. Okay. It always seemed like you wanted to be part of Rockapel. Was that an act, or did you actually want to be a singer? Oh, well, you know, like I said, I had a contract in a national. I mean, I, I, I didn't want to be a singer, but I can't, I can't to me, it's about the writing. And it, I, think, I think for me, uh, I come from a family of singers, and so I know that I'm not a singer. I didn't have very good singers in my family. And um, actually, the church of my family is a part of, uh, all they do is a cappella singing. And so I've always, I've, I've had that in my life for a long time. But I've always been the bad one. I've always been the one that couldn't pull it off. <laughs> and here's some of the uh, more interesting questions. Uh, where is Carmen San Diego now? <laughs> I always love that question. I have no idea. Weren't they, weren't they supposed to be doing a movie about her? Wasn't, wasn't that, uh... I have no idea. That's, uh... Okay. Well, you know all these other answers, but you might know that answer. Yeah, I don't know where Carmen is right now. That's a very good question. Come out of retirement, get that taken care of. Yeah. Any future plans to reboot the show? Uh, I think we've already cover that question. It doesn't sound like there's anything in the uh, works about it, unless I'm missing something. I Did you learn a lot of geography during your tenure as host? Oh, yeah, absolutely. And the thing was, I thought I knew a lot about it before, because I was always a map lover when I was a kid anyway. But, uh, yeah, I absolutely did. And like I said before, I, I think one of the biggest things for, for all of us then was uh, the Soviet Union first broke apart. I mean, that was all new information, you know, when all those new countries came in. I still don't know all the African countries and South America can still confuse me sometimes. Now we're getting into, uh, you know, the very nether regions of these uh, questions. No offense, Sam, my friends, but um, here are some of them. Uh, what are your thoughts on the Syrian refugee crisis and how should we solve it? Dude, I know nothing about that. It's horrible. Yeah. Good question. Right, next question. Uh, Wrong guy to ask. Was OJ really innocent? <laughs> All right. Uh, can we smoke in here? <laughs> I think you should be able to, but you probably should. <laughs> All right. Um, who put the bump in the bump a bump a dump? Who put the rum in the rum a lama ding dong? I am not at liberty to say at this time. <laughs> All right. And probably the question that got the most likes on my Facebook page: What can the Chinese stock market do to quell international financial fears? <laughs> All right. Um, again, these, these are questions from other people. Some of them, I, I don't know if they're being. Uh, some people probably weren't, but um, I'll just uh, leave it at that. Uh, but uh, yeah, is there anything else you would like to add before we sign off here? Well, I, you know, I just have to compliment you, man. I think you do a great interview. I'm going to try to listen to your podcast all the time. I love this. You're a very good interviewer, and. Um, I'm honored to have been here, and I appreciate you uh, letting me be here. Thanks for all the questions for everybody. Yeah, it's great. And now, I have one last thing I'd like to ask of you, and you just humor me for a moment. Could you just put yourself in a moment... Thanks. Uh, could you just put yourself in a moment, uh, pretend like I've just won the map, you've already read the trip I'm going to. Uh, I'm sure you remember how the show used to end every all the time, right? Do yeah, right. Could you just uh, you know, put yourself in a moment and you know, act like I'm there, you're on stage, and you know, we're about to end the show? Okay, yeah. Sure. You just pick your place? Where, where did you pick? It doesn't matter. It's after I've read it. Uh, just uh, how you ended every show. Can you just uh, put yourself in that sure. moment and just recreate that? You got it. Yeah. Jeffrey, yeah, you've done a great job. Looks like you're going to be going to Iowa, no matter what everybody else says. We got one more last thing to do. You know what it is. Do it, Rockapella. <laughs> All right, thank you very much. So for bonus content and podcast news, 
You can like the 90s Youth Life Facebook page. You can uh, also uh, hear all my episodes at youthlife90s.podbean.com. Greg Lee, host of Where in the World is Carmen San Diego. Thank you so much. I'm Jeffrey Clark for 90s Youth Life. Grow old, but don't grow up. <laughs>